And just because I'm going to be getting, probably get a little bit negative, <laughs> I'm actually very passionate about AI. Uh, I started in AI in the, in the 70s, so it's been 40 years, uh, and I love the technology we've created. But for the last probably 10, 12 years, um, I've, become, I've gone from poacher to gamekeeper to look at the, our responsibility for the technology we, we've created and we're still creating. So that's the approach I'm giving you today. Okay. So what kind of relationships can we have with our technology? Friend, companion, personal, romantic, controlling, loving, adversarial, servile, professional, therapeutic. I'll answer that at the end. But now I'm going to just look a little bit, tell you a little bit about being human and what it is to be, you know, what humans' failties are. Um, I, I also have a PhD in psychology, so I like to look at that. So we're looking here of what you can see. We can see faces in everything. Designers have been exploiting this for centuries. I mean, right back in ancient Egypt, they had little puppets that exploited our tendencies to see faces and movement of things. This was on my flight over, and the stewardess said, oh, where'd you get that face from? I said, it's from your cupboard there. She was quite surprised. Now that's called par pareidolia. And pareidolia is a part of something we call anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism is our projection of human-like qualities into machines, into inanimate objects actually, or gods, uh, or animals, but I'm talking here about inanimate machines. So we project into those. Now way back, the end of the uh, 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, there was a very clever horse called Hans that changed the face of biology. Now Hans had this skill and he wasn't specifically trained for it, he was just rewarded every time he got it right. He had this specific skill, he hold up a little blackboard with a problem on it like 5 times 4 and Hans would type it, tap out 20 or, or the appropriate response. He could do the same with clocks, he could do it with all sorts of things and everybody was stunned by it. The Berlin Academy of Psychology did an investigation, they ran a commission, they had circus trainers, they had all these people and they all ended up saying Yes, Hans was a really intelligent being that thought like humans. That was the response. 1907, a young psychologist had a different idea. So he had a go at Hans. And what he did was he got actors to hold up the, the board. And the actors had to keep a very straight face so that they weren't giving anything away. Lo and behold, Hans still got the problems right. So then his next step, which is a clever psychological step, he, helped, he got the actors to hold up the board, but they didn't see the problem. They didn't know what they were holding up, and Hans was completely useless, tapped out randomly. So for me, I thought it was still clever, because what the horse was doing was going from exact facial expressions, tiny facial expressions, even of the actors. So at that point, biology went for this thing of, let's not be anthropomorphic anymore about animals. Let's develop an objective science. That was 2007. By 2012, Loeb wrote a book called Mechanistic Biology. And that put a real objective biology in place that what we've got today with all our medicine and everything else, we start talking about uh, moths having a desire to fly into flames, those kinds of things. Now, we haven't done that with AI so much. I mean, I worked in machine learning for, since 1981, and we used mathematical descriptions. But nonetheless, in the lab, people just talk very generally. You'll hear people here talking about AI as if it was a, a, an entity, um, but it's just a machine. So, so this anthropomorphism is, is rife. Now, you all remember the Trojan Morse, I'm sure, um, that came into the city of Troy, <coughs> was pulled in, was left there, and then went at night time, all the soldiers crept out. Well, I use the word Trojan terms for much of what happens in AI. So people use terms like cognition, thinking, um, guilt. Guilt's a good one. Ron Arkin, who's developed a, an ethical governor for, for military machines, when well, he was trying to, he didn't succeed really. 
effectively, but he tried to had guilt in there because he thought that you know this machine should feel guilty. But for him, guilt was a simple mathematical function, like a thermostat. It, 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 every time it got something wrong, it incremented by one until it reached a threshold, and then it stopped functioning. So 